Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome uh, to the next frontier in evidence-based policymaking, the science of scaling, uh, hosted by Brookings and the TMW Center for Early Learning and Public Health at the University of Chicago. Uh, my name is Omar Woodard. I'm Vice President of Solutions at uh, Results for America. Uh, Results for America, uh, our mission is to make data-driven and evidence-based policymaking the new normal for government decision makers at all levels. Uh, and we work at all levels of, of government to build government capacity and leadership capacity to do just that. Uh, relevant to me, prior to Results for America, I spent 10 years in venture philanthropy, really working to invest to scale models and organizations in cities across the country, including early learning models, uh, such as Parent Child Plus, Nurse Family Partnership, Apple Tree, and, and, and many, many others. Really thrilled to have an amazing panel with us here today, uh, which is uh, who is able to talk not just from the research and evaluation side of scaling, but also uh, government sector side of scaling and how government can best be involved uh, at the leadership level uh, to really make these things happen uh, successfully, but also identify areas uh, where there's opportunity for growth. Um, I'd like to start by introducing uh, our, 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 our famed panel uh, and start with, uh, with Elaine Kmark, who's the director and senior fellow uh, at the Center for Effective Public Management Governance Studies at Brookings. Um, next, we have John List, who's the founder and co-director of the Center for Early Learning and Public Health at the University of Chicago. Uh, and he is, of course, a named professor, the Kenneth C. Griffith, uh, Griffin Professor uh, of Economics at the University of Chicago. Uh, we have Dana Suskin, uh, who's the founder and co-director of the TMW Center for Early Learning and Public Health. Uh, and she is, among many things, a professor of surgery and pediatrics uh, uh, at the University of Chicago uh, uh, Medicine. Uh, and, and finally, of course, as a native Philadelphian, uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, introduce the former mayor of the city of Philadelphia, uh, Michael Nutter, uh, who uh, last I spoke with him now has a number of new roles, um, but is uh, incredibly involved both at the University of Chicago, Columbia University, and a range of other places. And of course, uh, I believe the 98th mayor of the city of Philadelphia. So I'd like to thank all of my panelists for being here. Uh, very excited to, for, for the conversation coming up. Uh, before we jump in, I just wanna let viewers know that you can submit any questions you have uh, for any of the speakers we have here uh, by emailing events at brookings.edu, events at brookings.edu, or you can just post uh, at Twitter, uh, hashtag scale up effect is the hashtag we're using uh, for this discussion. Um, so I'd just like to frame a little bit of the conversation before we involve uh, our panel uh, in, in, in getting some questions and answers. Um, uh, University of Chicago uh, researchers, as we mentioned, John and Dana, and a number of other colleagues um, have worked uh, to identify the four sources uh, of challenges or threats uh, in research uh, around the challenge of, of scaling evidence-based programs, particularly, uh, particularly early learning, but more broadly. The challenge here, as, as, as you all know and, and, and may be aware, the government, philanthropy, and nonprofits generally work together to identify and scale and replicate models, uh, particularly in early learning, uh, every day, all across the country. Um, but there have been varying levels of success to that scale. Uh, and in fact, regardless of model fidelity, a real concern is, is there more than an art of scaling? Is there a science to scale? And what more can we learn to help local governments, state governments, nonprofit service providers, as well as funders, really figure out the best, uh, the best mix and configuration uh, to ensure that scale happens and happens successfully. Uh, I wanna highlight just four key sources and threats that, uh, that the research has noted. Uh, first is that individuals that are often studied in the research setting aren't representative of the population at large. And so it's very difficult to replicate in a different context. Second, the specifics of the program generally uh, and the way it's delivered and received uh, is also not representative of how it actually is delivered in a broader real world context once it's replicated. And third, uh, usually the initial and promising results um, are interpreted incorrectly, right? So meaning actually there's not enough sufficient evidence to actually support scaling in the first place, despite the promising, uh, the promising results that often lead to attract dollars to replicate. Uh, and then finally, there are often spillover effects in the initial study that weren't accounted for. And so the effects of the program may be stronger, they may be weaker, but the research really doesn't measure those effects. And so as a result, you don't really have a sense of the benefits uh, uh, or the harms uh, to those who either participated in the study or didn't. And so there's a lot here uh, and we're really happy to, you know, to, to have the researchers who have been doing this work and really begin to dig into these questions. So I'd like to start if I could, um, if I could with Elaine. 
um, and you know, really talk to you about you know, where are you seeing uh, similarities? Where are you seeing the differences in scaling failures across issue areas? But even more broadly, how have you, from your vantage point, been, uh, been learning about, thinking about, and involved in scaling broadly? And then let's talk about where you see some of the some similarities and the differences around uh, barriers and opportunity to successful scale. Thank you, Omar, and um, thank you. It's, it's nice to be on such a distinguished panel and um, welcome everyone to Brookings, to a Brookings webinar. Um, uh, let, me, let me start by saying I worked in the federal government some decades ago in the Clinton White House trying to reinvent government. And we encountered many, many wonderful experiments that in fact failed to scale. Um, the one that comes to mind, and I think you mentioned this in your policy brief, is this is not just the case in education, even though we, we have here early childhood education, but um, it's in all areas of government where we have promising experiments, promising research, and a failure to scale. Um, way back in 1993, we looked at a, an experiment in personnel at the China Lake Naval Weapons Center. Um, this was uh, very different from early childhood um, learning, but you'll, you'll see the similarity here in a moment. Uh, there were over 5,000 civil servants there. It was a very high tech research center developing weapons for the Navy. Um, and they had one heck of a problem. They couldn't retain people and they couldn't hire people. So they were losing talent all the time. They were losing scientists, they were losing researchers. And they had to change the personnel system. The GS system just simply wasn't working. Um, they got a special exemption to do so. That experiment started in, in the mid 1980s. By 1986, it was a terrific success. Um, and we went into the White House somewhat naively in 1993, thinking that we could spread this to the whole federal government. Well, we didn't. <laughs> Okay, there are some some aspects of that experiment, pay banding, et cetera, are you can find in some agencies, uh, TSA, the FAA have used some aspects from China Lake, but we could not scale that to the entire federal civilian workforce. Um, the reasons why, and that brings me to my next point, is that frankly, the experiment and the research are only the beginning of the policy change process. The policy change process almost always starts with a smart academic or, or an, an educated government employee uh, or somebody in, in a think tank or at a foundation doing some really interesting research. But that's only the start of the process. So I wrote a book not too long ago called How Change Happens, um, The Politics of U.S. Public Policy, and I urged people looking at change to do something, again, a concept drawn from the military, assess the policy battlefield. In the military, it's very good there. Everyone is taught to assess the battlefield. Well, assess the policy battlefield. And what you find when you break that down is that you have to look not just at the, um, the idea and whether the idea is good and, and perhaps warrants scaling, but then you have to go to areas that don't have much to do with the idea. You have to look at the inside players. You have to look at the outside players. So in, inside the government, you have to look at the outside players. Then you have to look at um, the public and whether or not there will be a public reaction. And you have to look at strategy and tactics and, and what kind of conflict may or may not arise from this. So we are only at the beginning of the process when we're looking at um, good, solid research that maybe should be scaled. And then we get into a very murky world, particularly when we're talking about government. Now I know Omar, you have experience in the private sector. So I, I, I can't, I, I don't have any experience there. I can't generalize, but I can tell you in the government sector, the good idea at the core of a, of a momentum for change is only one step 
towards the change. And uh, so I, I will say this is a hard question and one well worth uh, pursuing, and I'm glad to be here with you all. Elaine, thank you so much for really giving us uh, some, some more context around the, the, the broader uh, area in which scaling takes place. It's not just in early learning, workforce development, or what have you. It's, it's, it's broader than that. I really appreciate that frame. I'd like to take it to John, if I could. John, you know, uh, you know, we laid out kind of the four areas and threats, right, from, the, from, from your policy paper. You know, what, you know what, what advice do you have for researchers and, and innovators, you know, for whom scaling is important? Right, the the rapid uh, spreading of what works across city to city, county to county, state to state is incredibly important. Not from a competition perspective, but because every city, every leader, every mayor wants to implement the best ideas that have worked elsewhere that could work where they are. So, could you give us some advice or for for other researchers, your colleagues, or others who are who are ch who are challenged with this problem and are trying to address the threats that you laid out so well? Sure, absolutely. And I want to start by thanking Brookings. Um, for, for putting this forward and the other panelists. Thank you very much for joining. I think from both a policy perspective and an innovation perspective, this particular question is the most important question that scientists face today in, in trying to make change and, and make policy change. So the way I think about the problem is if I take myself back to when I first started working in Chicago Heights, which is a, a community just south of Chicago, I started a school for three to five-year-olds. Now, in that school, the goal was to give them uh, human capital or to help them along in the process of these three to five-year-olds. And this was called check. Now, we received very optimistic results. So our goal was to scale the program to all of Chicago and beyond. So we went to talk to some experts and what they told us just about uniformly is that your program will fail to scale because you will experience voltage drops. Now, a lot of you might be thinking, okay, what is a voltage drop? Now, I want you to think of it this way. If we had a hundred kids in our check program, our data show that we would help about 90 of them or 90%. If we scale the check program to 100,000 kids, therefore, you would hope to help 90,000 of them. But the voltage drop argument is that you will help many fewer children, maybe no more than 20,000 of them. So my question then was, why does this happen? And this is a relatively new area of study that really not only spans all of policymaking, but all of the idea generation space. I'm on the side, I'm the chief economist at Lyft. And in many cases, we face the same sorts of questions. Um, what are the signatures of ideas that will scale? So we got to looking at the literature and it's very difficult to find science around this problem. So what we've done is we've used behavioral economic models to explore the science of using science. That's sort of the moniker that, that uh, Dana and my team and I use. Now, as you pointed out, Omar, within that model, and within the broad data, as Elaine said, the data are, are ubiquitous, they're all over, whether it's policy or ideas, really a handful of signatures of scalable ideas comes out. And Omar, you talked about four of them. I wanna add a fifth today. So, so what Omar mentioned was, first of all, the evidence just isn't there to justify scaling. So the question for the policymaker then becomes, when is evidence actionable? Now, the next point is, well, were the wrong people studied? Another way to ask that question is, are the people in the original sample representative of people at large? The third bin is the wrong situation was used. And Elaine got to this a little bit when she was talking about, well, the political will of the actors and are the constraints that we'll have at scale, are they the same constraints that are used in the original research plan? And then as, as Omar mentioned, you have spillovers. And these are, in many cases, these are features that you won't pick up in the small study, 
But once you go very, very large, the market can become imbalanced. You can think about Lyft. If we give a lot of drivers a, a big benefit, a bunch of them come on and you have a market imbalance. So that's how I want you to think about spillovers. Now, the one I want to add to what Omar said was what an economist would call the supply side. Um, are there diseconomies of scale? When you go really large, does it just cost a lot of money to expand your program? And in a way, I want you to think about uh, in the original check program, we only had to hire maybe 20 or 30 teachers. But what happens when you have to hire 30,000 really, really super good teachers? What happens to the cost? Either the, the efficacy of the program will go down. Why? Because you have to hire lower quality inputs or you have to expand the budget to keep the quality really high so you don't have a voltage drop. So now all of these five signatures, Omar, speak to any idea. They speak to any policy or any idea, whether it's the private sector or the public sector, they all matter. You can kind of think about um, Anna Karenina. Uh, Leo Tolstoy talked about all happy families are alike and each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. When I think about ideas or policies, if they don't satisfy these five threats to scalability, they'll fail regardless of how ingenious people are who are carrying them out. John, I really appreciate that. And, and, and I wanna keep it in the policy context. I'm, uh, Mayor Nutter, I'll move it over to you. Uh, I think eight, nine months into your first term, uh, you, had, uh, you, you, had a, you had a crash uh, that you had to deal with that, was, that incredibly impacted the budget of the city, city of Philadelphia in your first year in your first term. I imagine what that did for your two terms is you had to begin to focus on what can I do that will get me impact and good results quickly uh, with, with, with as low cost as possible. Um, so could you talk about in your two terms um, how you approach this issue of identifying something small and growing it and sustaining it and what some of the barriers were uh, uh, from, from your perspective, giving some of those criteria that John just sure, mentioned? Sure. Um, Arma, thank you, and uh, certainly Elaine, John, and um, uh, Dr. Dana. Um, yeah, I mean, we were, you know, we were rocking and rolling. I just gotten elected in uh, 2007. Uh, people were excited. I was the reformer, wasn't supposed to win, blah, 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 all that story. And, um, you know, we had great budget, 4th of July, and then suddenly um, the finance director and the chief of staff uh, came to see me. Um, I was too new, too inexperienced to understand that when the finance director and the chief of staff need to see you, um, actually nothing good is going to come uh, from that <laughs> meeting. Um, but I didn't know that, right? So because I'm like, you know, first year rookie mayor. And they um, said, well, we, we, you know, we, we, we think we have some kind of problem, but we don't even know what's going on. This is like July, August. Um, and then uh, late August or early September said, no, we actually have a very serious problem. The recession had not yet been uh, declared uh, by the federal government, but we already saw, we were, that summer we were already seeing signs uh, that something was wrong. And then the feds, um, you know, federal government declared that we were in a recession. Um, the Phillies did win the World Series that year. So, I mean, it was that little bright spot um, and Barack Obama became president of the United States. So, um, and then the week after, uh, two days after the election, I declared that the city had a uh, $1.4 billion five-year plan deficit um, that kind of crushed the hopes and spirits of just about everybody in the city. Um, one of the things I, out of that experience, um, and, and we were fortunate to have, you know, you, you have to have a plan. Um, and we had some plans and then you have to make adjustments. And so the critical issues for us were, you know, we have to keep providing service. We cannot run out of money. Uh, we have to keep operations uh, going and people still expect their trash to be picked up, potholes filled and, and, and other fundamental uh, services. And so when you strip it all down, um, we really had to take government to what is our fundamental mission? What is our daily responsibility to the citizens. They hear, they understand, maybe they blame me, maybe they blame the universe uh, for uh, this recession. 
which is very different than what people are experiencing now. We, we were not in a pandemic, but a recession nonetheless, which at the time was characterized as the worst recession since the Great Depression. So, I mean, that was the context of where we were. And when you're the mayor, actually, it, pretty much everything is your fault anyway. It doesn't matter. People are not trying to figure it out. Um, I said, this will be a shared sacrifice. Everybody has to give up something for the greater good of the whole and for the entire city. And that certain services must be preserved. Um, we still have to educate kids. Um, again, we cannot run out of money. And so fiscal integrity became uh, a serious component. It already was, but it became a serious component because you ultimately realize you actually can't really run the place if you don't have any money, right? I mean, it sounds kind of simple, but it's real. Uh, and so um, you have to make some tough decisions. And that's where um, sticking to a plan, your own integrity, what you're willing to compromise on, what you're not willing to compromise on, and reversing, in many instances, uh, decisions or, position, or positions that you've held for a long period of time. So for instance, I was the leading advocate for tax cuts during my entire tenure in Philadelphia City Council. And one of the first things I had to propose was a tax increase to save the city. It was hard. Right. But, you know, again, running out of money or not being able to provide service or having to lay people off, I thought was even worse. And so every day we were presented with, you know, the 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 worst choices. And the decision is, how do you pick the least worst choice that does the least amount of damage for the maximum number of people? Um, there was a point where we literally and I announced that we were not going to pay any of our vendors to save money. Not one of them ever stopped providing service because we committed and promised that we would pay our bills, but we needed to get through this time. Uh, and so when you talk about scale and trying new things, trying different things, uh, you said something earlier, Omar, remind me of a little saying that I have that, you know, mayors always want to be the first to do something as long as someone else has done it before them. Uh, and so, because you, you need to know in the public sector, I mean, you have to know that this thing is going to work, right? I mean, you have a very limited amount of money, time, resource, and of course, the general public. And so, you know, you cannot be wasting money, you, you, you know, you can't be failing, right? And you're going to read about it on the front page of the paper the next day. As Mike Smith once said, uh, you experience the thrill of victory and the agony of reading about it the next day. Uh, that's that's the experience of, of, of Philadelphia. So they're not shy uh, about expressing themselves. And so this, I, the, 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 uh, what, what did John say? Using science for science or, you know, using technology, using science, using facts, using data, the work that you do, uh, you and, and Michelle and the whole team at Results for America, um, it really does help. Uh, beyond anecdotal stories, uh, it helps to have data. It helps to have evidence. And then to be able to explain to people, this is why we're doing what we're doing. Now, you may agree, you may disagree, but we have reasons. And lastly, and this is what we're trying to accomplish. We want you to be safe. We want your kids to get an education. We want to have jobs or preserve them, right? And we have to run the government with integrity and transparency. Those were the four pillars. And running out of money, deep recession, whatever the case may be, we never veered from those four fundamental principles, uh, which is what I ran on, which is what I committed to, and ultimately, which is really what saved uh, the city and took us into uh, the recovery period uh, after uh, 2011. Dana, what you heard from Mayor Nutter was, was something we hear a lot at Results for America, which is you know, innovation in the public sector looks different than it does in the private sector. The idea that the, the appetite for risk is very different, right? And it varies uh, from, from locale to locale. And so as you're thinking about scaling a great model in Chicago, a great model in Minnesota, a great model in Virginia to another place, you have to be kind of honest about those local contexts and how it plays out. Uh, Mayor Nutter gave you a fiscal environment and a whole bunch of other things that without that, some, or, some early learning models might have scaled much faster. So how do you react to the very real um, uh, threats 
right, and, and challenges to involving the government in the scale and, uh, and, and rapid acceleration of early learning models or others? How, 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 what are some of your reactions to Mayor Nutter's thoughts? Yeah, well, I think just the fact that all five of us are on this webinar and come from such incredibly different backgrounds speaks to the fact that this is not an easy issue to deal with. It's a multidisciplinary, you need every stakeholder as part of it. And actually, that's why I love the model of results for America, because really, everyone has their different incentives and biases. You know, as Mayor Nutter said, we all want the same thing. We want our children to be educated, people to be employed, good to happen, but we all have our different, Mayor Netter has to keep the fiscal balance, needs to be reelected. John needs you know, his papers published. You need, we all need different things. And really this is why you know, when we think about evidence-based policymaking, in fact, almost the easiest part is the first part figuring out programs that work, doing it on small scale. You can look at this time with COVID. Ironically, the easiest part was developing the vaccine. All right, not so easy, but that happened in rapid time. Where was the bottleneck? Getting that vaccine into you know, our population for all the different you know, uh, issues with scaling. So while I don't have an easy answer, I think really it points to the fact that this science of using science is a team-based approach, um, which brings in all the other different complexities of human beings. Um, I, I'm a surgeon. I always joke that the only people who don't come with their own biases and incentives are the patients under anesthesia. But otherwise, um, at every level, um, we have to deal with it. But on the other hand, if we are ever, ever to reap the benefits of science is the basis of social change, this is what we need to do. And that's why it's exciting. I think Elaine's point that this is not just an early learning issue or workforce issue, it is an issue at every aspect of government. Um, and I think actually Clinton, who you were in, in his, uh, during his time period said something to the effect, there are, there are interventions to, to address almost any issue. We have no lack of evidence-based interventions, but having those scaled and impact at a population level uh, becomes much less. And this is why this is the, the next uh, stage of evidence-based policymaking, so. Um, can, can I? I'm, please, 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 Mark. Yeah, I, I would say, Dr. Dana, but I'm increasingly nervous, uh, especially given what, his, what we've just all been through for the last 15 or so months, that, I mean, now even science is under question. Science is under attack. If we had stuck with science back in March of 2020, I think it is without dispute, fewer people would have died or gotten sick and the recovery would have gone that much quicker. If we had stuck to science um, and the understanding of science, and this is where this is the other thing I didn't talk about, uh, which is, of course, this is where politics and personalities come into play, uh, which, you know, uh, I mean, there's virtually no equation for that. As much as there are equations in economics, there are equations in, in uh, science and in, in Lane's work and results for America, that, that the, the variable of politics and personalities, um, you know, I don't know where you put that. Uh, you know, on the blackboard. Yeah, just if I could just answer that, I know John wants. Yeah, I, I'd like to answer it too, but go ahead, Dane. Elaine too. Everyone wants to jump in. I'll go I'll, Dana, then Elaine, then John. Two, two, two aspects. I think that what you speak to is incredibly important. Um, you know, there was a time period where it was the credibility revolution. Everybody was like, it's all about evidence. And because of this issue that it's not just about what happens on the small scale, but how do you take that small scale result and figure out how to do it on a large scale? You have people who start, I mean, there's some who are always going to disbelieve in science, but those who even do believe, we, this is why this, this next step is so critically important. Um, and I know that John wants to add, but there is one part in this model that isn't there, the issues of public will, political economy. And I'll let John speak to that. So I don't know if that's what he was gonna to speak to. 
Elaine, I know you want to jump in. Then we'll yeah, jump over I, I, I just wanted to jump in on the question. I think John raised a question that's kind of central to what we're talking about here, which is the, the policymaker has a hard time knowing when is evidence actionable. Okay, that that is that is hard because there's always there are always people who say not that it's not that your evidence isn't correct for the time, but there are people who are looking down the road um, to quote President Clinton again. He used to say the job of the president is to look down the street and around the corner. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that is the hard part. So with the China Lake experiment that I opened with, um, the problem there was that it ended up being about 5% more expensive than the old personnel system. Now, that doesn't seem like much, but OMB, whose job is to protect the federal right. treasury, said, well, wait a minute, we're not letting everybody do that, right? Because this is just a, this, you, you may have some good results from here, but frankly, this is a way to get to spend more money on personnel and we're not, we're not going there. Okay, so so people, some if you, if you think about the the world, if you think about the policy ecosystem, right, there are people in there with who who may admit to the science, but who are are skeptical that if you look down the street and around the corner, that that science will hold up. And I think that's why we have such problems with evidence based policy. A great point. Absolutely great point. John, please jump in. Okay, and so a, a lot to uh, to tackle there. L let me start by by uh, talking about uh, what Mayor Nutter brought up. So I think of knowledge creation as a chain that has three links. The first link I would call the philanthropy of science, which is a different research agenda of mine. How do we generate dollars both privately and publicly to fund science? The, the second link is what we're all talking about here today. And I advocate, Elaine sort of just brought this up. We always talk about evidence-based policy. We need to be thinking about policy-based evidence. Our model is about what are the incentives in the system right now that researchers, policymakers, and individuals are doing the right thing to put forward actionable evidence that will really work. That's what our model is really about. What falls out of that are prescriptions like the original scientist should be on the implementation team. The original researcher should spell out all negotiables and non-negotiables in their original research design. So that there are very, and then various other aspects, which I won't go into the weeds, but these are all things to try to accomplish the third link, which is correct when the mayor brought it up and, and Elaine brought it up too. And Dana just said political will. And to think about the leaders, the administrators, the facilitators, do they have the right incentives just to stick with the status quo because it's easy mm -hmm. and they think it's the right thing to do? Or are they going to go down the path that science tells them to? Right. Two levels with that. Our model teaches us that if we teach them about why the program works, so the underlying of not only do this program, but here's exactly the mediators for why it works, facilitators will stay truer to the program. The fidelity problem will at least be partly solved. Now let's go to the other level where, uh, where the mayor mentioned, and that's the, uh, the fight against science. And here, you never know around the corner what the next politician will do um, or who is the next politician who will be elected. So I would model that as a random walk. Okay, what's a, what you can say, what's a random walk? A random walk is think about the drunk who walks out of the bar and you try to guess, is a person gonna fall down? Are they gonna stumble left? Are they gonna stumble right? That's a random walk. Very, very difficult to predict. It's like asset prices in a way. So while it's true, we don't know what's around the corner for the next policymaker, we do know what good science is. And we do know that if we give actionable evidence and the, paper, the, the model that Dana and I and others have created, actionable evidence is essentially that we can be 95% certain that the policy works. 
So what does that mean? It means the original research in three or four independent replications. That's, that's essentially what that means. But, but at a, a broader level, you're right. We need to figure out all three of these chains. What we're talking about are three of these links in the chain. What we're talking about here today, primarily in my mind is the first one. The next model will take on the other, the next one, which economists have talked a lot about the political economy of decision-making and the political economy of who gets elected and why. Those are great questions. Political scientists can help us too. Um, but I'll, I'll stop there and, and throw it back to Omar. I used to think a random walk was just me deciding, you know, coming out of my driveway, which, which direction I was going to go for my, for my walk. I, I hadn't thought about it in the context that John had, had laid out. That's interesting. I, uh, I, this, I, I want to bring us back then to the fundamental issue of evidence-based policymaking. Yeah. And just like nail that for a second. Yeah. Let's just talk about that for the audience. So I'll, I'll start with Mayor Nutter and then I'll go to Elaine and then, and, and then come yeah. back to Dana and John. Well, uh, you know, uh, I'll maybe go a little more into the, you know, political will and where's the public and where are you? And, you know, so, you know, people who are elected, you know, generally, you know, like to think of ourselves as, you know, leaders and we're leading a parade, um, you know, uh, but again, I always recommend, you know, you might want to turn around from time to time and, you know, just see if anybody back there. Um, often we can literally be ahead of our public, which is a real challenge, uh, really, because you're, you know, as Elaine talked about, uh, and I, I do remember the president saying that, the, looking down the street and around the corner. And, and sometimes you do actually know or have a really good sense of what's around that corner, but you've still got to go on that straight path first to get there. And sometimes people can't see the same things that you see. And so one of the uh, uh, important qualities of leadership is you have to bring people with you. You have to help them uh, have that same vision. I mean, you know, we're not talking about just going to the optometrist and paint a picture, tell stories, and help people understand where it is that you're trying to take them, where it is you're trying to go, which ultimately really has to be the place where they want to go, right? You, if you try to take people kicking and screaming, even if it's good for them, right? I mean, how many of us have ever tried to get our kid, you know, to take some medicine? This, no, this is good for you. No, I've had this before. This is really bad. No, I don't, right? So, um, you know, it's a different kind of challenge, uh, I think, with the, uh, with the public. And you have all the evidence you want. Um, but at the, some days, at the end of the day, the data is not enough. It's just not enough. It will not carry the idea, the weight of the idea by itself. People have to imagine, you know, what that thing is, what is around the corner, how good is that going to be, and why you're the person to take them there. Elaine. Um, let, let me take off from, from that. Um, and the mayor mentioned stories, okay? Um, if you think about a pyramid of a policy development, right? At the bottom of that pyramid is almost always an academic study, a government study, a, 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 an experiment, right? Some, some kind of innovation with data, all right? However, there are, as, as those of us who've been university professors know, there are hundreds and hundreds of wonderful ideas that sit in the drawers in academic offices and never ever see the light of day. So what do you need to, to move it, right? What do you need to move from that study to the world? Well, usually the first thing is actually press coverage. And press coverage requires, and this is what the mayor, made me think of, press coverage requires stories. It requires anecdotes. It requires something that makes the data come alive. And I think that we academics frequently undervalue the importance of storytelling as a result of our data. And therefore our data doesn't get past our peers into the public. If you can get press coverage and if you can get stories, guess what? you can get a politician to talk about it. Yeah. 
and you can get a politician to give a speech about it. And to and politicians are experts, or else they wouldn't be successful at turning complicated things into people language, into kitchen table language. So that's kind of the next step on on this this rung. And then, of course, if you're really really successful, you get a bumper sticker. Okay, <laughs> you get a it's on a bumper sticker. End welfare as we know it. Okay said it all, right? So, so that's, the, that's the way an idea moves through the system. Now, the other thing to bear in mind is, and this is, John, an old political science concept called the scope of conflict, invented by a guy named E. e. Schnatzneider in 1960. So it's really old, right? But it, it still works. There are some policies where the scope of conflict is actually very small. The public never hears about it. The newspapers never write about it. Nobody particularly cares about it, but it is fought out in a small scope of conflict. One of the things that make that one of the ways that people make mistakes a lot in policy is they try to expand the scope of conflict. And the problem is you don't know what's going to happen. You could win with the expansion or you could lose with the expansion. Um, in fact, I, I wrote a case study not too long ago, not too many years ago, about the 2007 um, immigration bill, the failure of that immigration bill. That's the last comprehensive immigration bill we ever had. And one of the reasons it flopped was because they expanded the scope of the conflict, created a massive counterweight, and the, the two coalitions that might have come together to pass it simply collapsed at this weight. So there, there's a lot of things that move when you move beyond the evidence um, have an impact. And the evidence itself uh, can be good, it can be bad, or it cannot matter at all. Now, third point I want to make, and then I'll shut up, okay, is that sometimes you get there's contradictory evidence. So I will call your attention to the failed um, climate change bill in 2010 um, under, under Obama. Okay, that thing just died. Why? Well, because the, John Kerry, who was the, one of the lead senators, was saying this will cost Americans no more than a postage stamp a month. And other, and which doesn't seem like very much money. And other politicians were saying, no, 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 your electricity bills are going to go up by $4,000 a month. And each of them had their own methodology, right? And the, the own way that they had figured out their evidence. I mean, there wasn't any, it, what, there wasn't any baloney in this. It was just a different way of going about it. Well, the politicians said, uh-uh, not us. We're not going there because we don't know which one of these evidences, right? We don't know which model is gonna be the one that works. And the, the whole thing fell apart. Um, they, they never called it up for even a vote on, on the floor of the, of the Senate. So um, that, that's, why, that's why the evidence alone exists in a, in a very, very big ecosystem that's pretty complicated. Start with Dana, then go to John. That's there, there's a lot there for you all. So uh, feel free to go, go ahead. The only thing I, I would add here is, you know, data and, and and evidence is clearly not enough. There's a lot more storytelling that needs to be had in order to tran translate research into you know actionable next steps for policymakers to, to to go forward. But what does that mean for 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 researchers? What does that mean for the folks who are you know early on gathering the data, collecting the data, and just putting it out there? What obligation is, is, is there for them to continue on the path of that journey and not just pass it off, hoping, hoping that policymakers will do the right thing? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off and I'll answer it in two, two bits. Um, but I'll, I'll answer the easier part of it. Um, what is the obligation of the researcher? I think what's so critically important when you're thinking of these new innovative ideas, it really gets to John's point that it's not just about developing evidence-based, future evidence-based policies, but really putting yourself in the shoes of the policymaker and the practitioner. Uh, you do no good by developing programs that are the Cadillac of all programs um, that are unattainable and incredibly expensive. So I think that part of this next journey is really getting researchers to start thinking in that way. 
So that's that's the easier part. The different, more difficult part is, you know, how do you know we've we brought the population along. I think most people would say, look, data and evidence, you know, are critically important. We want evidence-based policies without, you know, without really starting to tackle this next step of how you take these policies to scale. And, you know, I come from the world of medicine where it's complicated, but not quite as complicated. I'm a surgeon and there's nothing easier than going into the operating room. I have an evidence-based piece of technology that I implant into a little child who's born deaf and suddenly they're able to hear. But what's very interesting in my own journey and why I'm in, in the world of social sciences is that you can start off with this incredibly important piece of evidence-based technology or intervention, put the implant in, and that really lays bare just this gap between what happens next and the fact that all the difficult stuff, ed, you know, education, intervention, et cetera, is much harder to implement. Um, and towards that end related to bringing the population along, I think having them understand that the promise of evidence-based policymaking requires us to go to this next step um, and really think about it in a detailed way. Um, and I think one of the best ways to share this information is at this point, most of the, popu the population believes in general in the power of medicine and evidence-based medicine. Um, and sharing the stories that 50 years ago, um, and I get this story from Jack Shankoff, 50 years ago, when I was born, a little bit longer, um, the, the results, if you were a child with leukemia of survival were in the single digits, right? You fast forward 50 plus years, you have a 95, 97 plus survival rate. I mean, evidence, you know, in science works for, for changing the trajectories of lives. At the same time, 50 plus years ago, we have one of the most famous evidence-based early childhood interventions, abecedarian. Abecedarian not only showed huge impacts, it was early childhood as you would wish every child, uh, education that you wish every child could have. Um, it started in zero to five. It had huge impacts on the children, both from, a, from an IQ, test score, you know, workforce development, you know, teen pregnancy, but it had huge spillovers. It had huge spillover over effects for their moms. Their moms uh, increased their education um, and employment. You look at these two, two interventions, huge impacts in, um, for children with leukemia now, you, you look at abecedarian, we have tried repeatedly, you know, it has, fa it has failed to scale. The promise of this incredible program has failed to scale and really allowing people to know that because we haven't scaled, it doesn't mean that program didn't work. We just need to take it to the next step. And I'm not a powerful storyteller, but these stories need to be shared. So, because it's hard work, it's not easy, but if we don't do it, we will ne never get the promise but I will stop there. Yeah. So those are three difficult acts to follow, but let me try to pick off an element from the various uh, vignettes. And uh, I'll, I'll start with Elaine's point about a narrative. And um, I, I think you're spot on there. When you look back to the eighties and the DARE program, so I, I, I have a book coming out uh, titled The Voltage Effect. And in chapter one, I talk about the D.A.R.E. program of Nancy Reagan. To me, that's the poster child for a false positive. It had one set of results from Honolulu and it could not be replicated or scaled, but the narrative was just so wonderful that it ended up getting rolled out. Narratives absolutely matter. And one manner in which we can kind of unlock the academic journals and get the ideas out is to have people like uh, Danny Kahneman and Stephen Dubner and Stephen Levitt and Gladwell and Dana has a popular book, uh, write about that, that great science to unlock it. So I think narratives certainly do matter. And you can just look historically in the US or abroad and you'll find that. Now, 
Mayor Nutter, I think you make a great point about decision making. Uh, 20 years ago, when I worked in the White House, there was a rule, and I think it still holds today, that every economically significant rulemaking has to undergo a formal benefit cost analysis. Okay. And economically significant rulemaking back then was it had to have either 150 million in annual benefits or annual costs. And there were roughly 70 of those per year back then that we had to do a formal benefit cost analysis on. Now, that was just one piece of the decision process, the, the proceeds from that benefit cost analysis. Why? Because that's really an examination of efficiency. You know, how much greater are the benefits than the costs? But many times more important is equity. Mm. Where do those benefits and costs reside? And in many cases, when you talk to researchers about what evidence are you giving us, they say, well, the benefits are 20 million a year, the costs are gonna be 5 million, so let's go ahead with the program. Mm -hmm. That's where we run adrift because we should be talking about that's a starting point, but where are the benefits going? Where are the costs going? And is this an equitable purchase for the government to make that? And if not, we should reconsider it. We've been talking about efficiency the entire time here, whereby equity needs to have an official place at the table as well. And until we start taking equity seriously, evidence-based policy doesn't make sense. It's nonsense. Uh, it needs to be evidence both based on how big is the pie, but also how that pie is divided. Now, we can do that as researchers. You can think about multi-site trials. You can think about over space and time and people, where do the pieces of the pie go? And that's what we should be doing as researchers in the very beginning in the Petri dish, figuring out does this work and who does it work for? Mm -hmm. And is that the value proposition we want society to take? And again, that's just one piece of the discussion, but it becomes a very important piece where we can use science. I'll stop there. John, you were on a roll. That was a strong roll there um, and, and, and absolutely right. Uh, we're starting to get questions in from the audience and it's significant. Um, so I'm gonna go through a quick lightning round here, ask for um, quick thoughts on, uh, on questions. So one, um, it's a really great question. When thinking about scale, should we just focus our work at current scale rather than bother at all with scaling up? I think the, the, the assumption here is, should we just improve the quality of our work at our existing footprint and deepen the quality rather than potentially watering down the quality as you broaden out? Um, I'll start with Dana. Well, first it depends on your goals. Um, I think that the real question is that you we need to figure out how things work and ensure that they're that it's data driven before you start scaling up and that as you scale that it's not it doesn't be doesn't become disconnected from the data driven feedback that's so necessary that there isn't drift so yes before you scale up you want to make sure that it's it's working as intended um, because the one guarantee is when you if you aren't when you scale up uh, it is unlikely to get better, it'll likely worsen. Mayor Nutter, you said something before about you know, growth for growth's sake isn't, isn't, isn't necessarily beneficial. Um, could, could you say a little more about that? Well, you know, it's it, the, the easiest way to get something started, uh, generally, especially in the government, is, is the pilot, right? Uh, that's, that's the government's level of you know, risk-taking. We're willing to do this little thing it may or may not work. Um, it's not so big. It's going to like cause the place to collapse uh, if it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, yeah, it'd be a little embarrassed, but you know, you can move on to other things uh, pretty quickly. The challenge is, like most other things, it's you know the quality. It's quality control. Uh, it's the how many more people are you bringing into it? How well are they trained? Uh, what's the ethos uh, and the culture? Uh, by the time they arrive, uh, things that you were doing in your first term, uh, in the political sense, in the government sense, you know, with 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 that crew of people, um, as certainly Elaine knows, you know, folks come and go, 
right? The, the, the second wave of people, you know, it's not their fault. They didn't come in with all the, you know, the, the hoopla, the bells and whistles, right? They're like, you know, yeah, I'm excited about this, but they, they just unfortunately don't get all of, you know, what, what the start is. And so you start to expand, maybe some things start to slip, your time is starting to run out. How much attention can you pay to this? You've got other things you're trying to get done. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm sure we did some of this. I mean, I tried to stay, you know, focused on the fundamentals, but I mean, you actually want to do a few other things. And the other part is, you know, you don't get to pick your moments. You, the moments pick you. So when stuff happens, this, this might be a family Zoom, so I'll leave it up. When stuff happens, right, you're going to get distracted, right? If three people got shot today, I mean, you know, I, I, I think that's, that might crater the rest of my schedule. If one of my, you know, public employees, something happens to them. If somebody got indicted, if, you know, whatever, whatever, or city council did, you know, something. I mean, that's the end of that day. Because it is. Um, other events take over. Uh, you know, can you maintain the momentum? You know, momentum is not self-sustaining. You have to keep pushing that thing. Uh, you or your team has to keep pushing that thing or it will slow down. Um, and, you know, it's just, um, it's, it's, it is a challenge. Everyone's also looking at the calendar. You know, I mean, I, I tease all my friends in Chicago. You know, we have, actually have a, you know, two consecutive term limit uh, in Philadelphia. I'm like, you know, Chicago, right? So, you know, you got an X amount of time. You're fortunate for to, to get a first term. You're really lucky to get a second. And then it's out, right? So, you know, and then other people know how to count too. So they're like, yeah, you're in your sixth year. I don't have to do that thing. I'm just gonna wait you out, right? And you'll be gone, right? <laughs> or, or I've moved on to, you know, the next thing. Cause my team would say, you know if we did all the stuff you wanted to do we would actually get nothing done, right? You have 15 ideas a day. One of them is, might actually be good, right? <laughs> and we'll try to work on that. Um, in contrast to the last great idea that you had last week that you, you redirected our attention to. So, you know, you only have so much time. And, and scale takes time, uh, even when you're the mayor. You might think you're in charge. Um, you know, it's kind of true, but you're not completely in charge. It might be the same for the president of the United States as well. So you're only going to, you, you get done what you can get done. Yeah, right? that's, that's, you that's literally pass the baton and then that's it. Can I, can I, a, can I please make go, a, ahead, go ahead, Elaine, and I'll go yeah, to the next question. I mean, one of the ways to make change more permanent, and, and the mayor talked about the other side of this, is concentrate on the bureaucracy. So in the federal government, the bureaucrats are there for 20 or 30 years. Right. So they're an important constituency. So Absolutely. when we set out to reinvent government, they were our audience. Yeah. And if they liked something, yeah. it would happen. They so happen. Now, that now there are things people ask me, well, what did you accomplish? I said, well, think about many issue many items that 25 years ago, nobody was doing. Now there's standard operating procedure in the government and nobody even realizes where they came from. Well, that's because we embedded them in the bureaucracy, not in the political will. Now we needed the political will for them to, to you know, kind of move in the first place, but, they, but what kept them alive year after year, I, I do a little bit of work or I, I did a little bit of work in developing countries. And of course, one of the huge problems in developing countries is they don't have a professional bureaucracy. There is no such thing. So, you know, you might get a reform prime minister elected, you know, and the, the man or woman will come in and they'll do all sorts of great things. And then the minute they're gone, the whole thing falls apart. Okay. It, it doesn't happen. So it's a, you, you, you see that, but in our in the developed world, uh, there's a real value to having a career bureaucracy because when you get something over the hump, yeah. um, it's likely to last. Yeah, I want to, if I can, I just really want to reemphasize what. So, um, and and this is said with with respect. Uh, we used to talk about the, I mean, you know, the people who are in the government for a long time who actually really run the government, right? And we we said 
that's that's the B team. And it's not it's not a, a bad mark. It's be here when you get here, be here when you leave. Right. They run the place. <laughs> they actually run the place. Right. They make they make the, the things happen. And not that I want to be known this to be my known legacy, uh, but as just one example. So, I mean, I didn't invent recycling. Right. Of course, I mean, the government was right. But what we did do, we made it easier. We put recycling on the same day as your trash day. The way to embed change and innovation is to make something so palatable, so easy, so enjoyable by the public that no one can change it. Now, they'll do a lot of things here in Philly about trash and recycling. But no one is going to change same day recycling as trash pickup, right? Because the public will go crazy. Right? You've given me something I really enjoy. Do not try to take it away. Um, That's change. That's a really important so part. That's that a really Omar, important part. I, Please go. Answer, hey, we're, uh, we're going, just, John. Just one minute. To, I'll just go fast. Just one minute how I would answer the, the person's question, because I think it's a very good one. And I, I don't want people walking away from this conversation thinking um, big change can only happen at scale. And what they told me is that it has to be large scale to matter, which is not true. Exactly as Dana mentioned that, it, first of all, it depends on your goals, but secondly, it depends on the signature of your idea. Like for example, humans don't scale very well. Um, look at the chef. Um, any, any good chef where the magic is the chef, they're going to fail if they try to go too hard with scale because that's their magic. If the magic is the ingredients like dominoes, ingredients can scale. My brother and father are both truck drivers and their magic is they're, they have the gift of gab. They can talk to people. They, they uh, work with farmers. They take the farmer's goods to the mill. They're perfectly happy with one truck in themselves and they have great lives. They don't have to worry about having an entire fleet of trucks. Why? Because what they have won't scale. That's great. That, that's okay. So the, I think the person's asking, what if we only have something that will work in our locality? Should we just give up on it? No, no. dig deeper, make it better. But remember, if you do have some magic that has signatures that can scale both horizontally across space or vertically, yeah. do it. But we have to understand what are those signatures of good ideas that will scale. And that's where we try to add science to that problem. That goes into the next question that just came in on top of the challenges already discussed. What about the likelihood that human interaction works differently at small scale versus large scale? And a lot of what that could look like is, to your point, you can hire 30, 40 really good teachers, but if you need 30,000, that becomes more difficult. So how, how, what, what are some of the ways that you know, alternatives, not alternatives to scale, but is it a series of smaller pieces? Or does it, does it have to be a larger piece? Um, or can we recognize that instead of, you know, instead of needing 30,000 teachers in one place, you have a hundred places across the country that each have 330 teachers. How might yeah. you, you, you react to that? I'll start with John and I'll work on Great, great. So I'll, I'll go really fast because the, other, the others have much smarter things to say than I do. Um, so my, my first point would be, it is possible in some instances to explore what the effect, for example, you brought up teacher quality might do on the benefits. And there's a really nice academic paper written by Jens Ludwig, uh, John Gerian, and John Davis and others that essentially what they do is they explore the nature of, let's say you only have to hire 25 teachers, but why don't you hire them across the quality spectrum? So then that's now a way to see if the high quality teachers are leading to much bigger and better results in the low quality, and now you don't have to do that at scale, you have a good replica in the Petri dish. So that, that's one, our model says, just like when we do experiments where we try it on different types of people, old, young, uh, men, women, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's an experimental blocking on populations of people 
What we argue is you should also block on properties of the situation and see what's negotiable or non-negotiable in your original research design. Because that's point one. Point two is you brought up um, network effects, really, which was really a wonderful point. If you look at some products like Facebook uh, or like any good that has network externalities in the small scale, having Facebook isn't really very beneficial. But if a zillion other people have it, now you having Facebook is really, really beneficial. So a lot of our programs have these network type effects where you might not get them in the Petri dish, but you might have them at scale. And then we're systematically underestimating the value of programs in the Petri dish. One example is in Chicago Heights. It's a spillover example, but what we find is that we randomly put people in treatment and control. And we find if the control kids have a significant number of treatment kids who live by them, it's like they were in treatment themselves. So I think understanding in the small scale what those network externalities and spillovers look like can really give us a lot of insight about what will happen at scale. So I, I think that's just a wonderful question, whoever inquired. Uh, I'll turn it over to the others. Just, just to add to that, I don't think it's, an, it's necessarily to use humans or not use humans. In, in general, hu having humans involved increases the impact and the effect of programs if done correctly. And so if you develop a program that requires a lot of human capital, understanding the different structures needed to ensure that fidelity continues to occur. So for example, in early childhood development um, and workforce training, we know, I mean, you're not going to put your child in a daycare that a child care center that doesn't have humans. Uh, at the same time, you know that continual um, professional development and coaching is necessary to have the impacts. So it's less, you know, to have humans or not have humans, but to have the right structures to ensure that the program is implemented uh, as intended and the core drivers are involved. Uh, in that same way, having, you know, in, in government last with Obama, they had nudge units because behavioral nudges were all the rage and are incredibly important. In that same way, I think starting to think about having implementation units to help support different branches of government who are implementing evidence-based programs are going to be critical as well. Can I come, maybe I was misconstrued. I never said not to include humans. I'm just saying that humans, Humans don't typically don't scale. <laughs> I'm not saying uh, substitute robots for humans. <laughs> As a father of eight children, I, I love, I think humans are important. Yeah, we have a <laughs> tough conversation tonight. Yeah, no, I wasn't implying that. That's, that's very funny. Um, I, wanna, I, I wanna pivot quickly. We have about 15 minutes left uh, in our conversation. And so we're hitting a home stretch. And I'd, I'd like to spend the last 15 minutes um, talking about something that John had referenced earlier, which is the issue of, of, of equity and, and, and scaling. And there's a great question, um, uh, which I'll, I'll read directly, which is how can we ensure that scaling up effective innovations is done in an equitable way, reaching low resource and vulnerable communities, as well as higher income populations? As we've seen with COVID vaccines, richer places receive the vaccine much more quickly than poorer places, and now many developing countries are suffering. And so I would like each of you to kind of give a, you know, your point on you know, the issues of equity as it relates to evidence-based policymaking, understanding that data and evidence can be loaded terms, right? Uh, you know, data collected by whom, uh, evidence to what end, and who determines uh, what, what in fact evidence is. So these are, these are loaded terms. And so uh, with an equity lens on it, I'd like for each of you to go around. We'll start with Mayor Nutter. When you started forming that question of our uh, the, the word that immediately you know kind of that word association game we play in our heads the first word that came to my mind was intentionality you have to be intentional about what it is that you're trying to accomplish that means you also have to be honest about you know either what was or what is and so again you made reference to COVID, right so you know why don't we start a conversation by saying 
Yes, we would actually like 330 million Americans to get a uh, vaccine as soon as possible. We know that that will be a challenge. We also know, uh, as we've now seen with you know, COVID sickness and death, uh, that there are significant disparities in communities of color, black, Latino, people of color, uh, uh, you know, in cities, possibly in some suburban areas, maybe even rural. Our plan is to focus on those who are most likely to get the least amount of service, while at the same time, we know all the rest of you who are most likely to get your own service, I, you know, provision is gonna be made for you as well and, and not get into the false choice of, um, well, all, you know, God bless the child has got his own and everybody that can get to the right place at the right time, great for you. And we'll get around to, you know, all these other folks at some point in time which to some extent is what happened, right? So I, I think you just have to call it out, uh, speak on it, uh, talk about it, and then take action on it. And not be um, apologetic, not be, you know, because ultimately people of means are gonna figure it out uh, to some extent. I'm not suggesting you don't have a plan for everybody, but you, got, you have to call out uh, what is so blatantly obvious in some of these situations. And then, you know, those who want to be upset about it, you know, hey, sorry about that. Uh, but uh, otherwise, a lot of folks, again, end up getting left behind. 100%. Elaine, I want to go over to you, um, talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the, this issue of equity, this issue of data and evidence with equity, and then talking about evidence-based policymaking. How does policymaking address the, the question of, of, of evidence and equity of, in terms of what we want policymakers to do. Are we, are, are, are we sure that what we're giving them is, is, is equity centered in, in and of itself? Well, obviously the first place to start is to make sure that your, the design of your research, right? Gives you the right data to, to get to the equity questions. And a perfect example um, the mayor mentioned is, COVID, is the COVID vaccines. So Earl, um, my, co my colleague at, at Brookings, Bill Galston and I <clears throat> were, were monitoring this and writing about this as, it, as the vaccines rolled out. And in the first month, month and a half, almost no states were tracking vaccinations by race. No. OK, now they and the other, they were tracking them by age. So when they did track by race, what was happening is since there are more um, per percentage wise, there are more older white Americans than black Americans. We couldn't really get a good we really couldn't get a good sense of this. We didn't know. Is this a race problem or is this an age problem? Right. So. People kept asking the question, asking the question. Eventually, the state started reporting the race data. And what we discovered was it, it was sort of in between. The problem wasn't quite as bad as, we, as it looked at first, but it also wasn't very good. OK, um, because as you went down the age, as you opened it up to younger people, um, there were still racial disparities. So the you know, now that wasn't a, a research project, but clearly what you have to do is you have to build into your data collection the equity issues. Are you are you looking at you're looking at age? Are you looking at race? Are you looking not just at race, but low income? and race, you know, all, all of these things, because you can't begin to get to equity issues if you don't have the data to begin with. And it is amazing how many um, designs don't or can't include race, because after all, I mean, if African-Americans say are 11, 12% of the population, you know, a lot of research designs just don't get enough people in that to, to make any meaningful um, conclusion. So you've got to oversample, right? You've, you've, got to, you've got to make sure that you have a big enough group that the numbers can actually tell you something real. So I think that the first place to begin is actually with the design. And that is, that is something that is, is difficult. And the reason it is, of course, it gets expensive, right? You, you want to do, you, you know, doing 3,000 people is expensive. Doing 3,000 and oversampling by 500 in order to get enough African Americans in sample, your costs go up. So, so we run into real. I think as researchers, and we run into real problems um, doing this. Now, 
One solution is, and the government is, is much better about this, the federal government, is make sure that the feds um, produce data by, by, by race, by age, by, by ethnicity, et cetera, um, because they're, they're the big data collectors. They've got the ability, they've got the ability to do it. And I think that that's, a, that's probably a good place to start. But if we don't have the data on equity, we can't make determinations on equity. John and Dana, I'll start. I'll start with John. You know, equitable evaluation, right? Equi you know, intentionality of you know of of design, uh, research design with the equity lens. How do you think about that kind of first order? Where, how, what, what advice might you have for the folks on uh, on our uh, on this webinar? No, oh, absolutely. It's it's a great question, and um, it's evergreen. So on on the one hand, Elaine is is absolutely right that where you start is in the original research. And, and I mentioned this earlier about multi-site trials, sort of a, an ironclad rule of policymaking is that on average, the policy doesn't work, but it always works for some, but not others. So I think getting that in an honest way up front, hmm. because there's so much heterogeneity in the world Sometimes it works, sometimes it, it won't. When it helps one group, it behooves us to come up with other programs that might help another group. That's like first order import to generate science. But where I would add is that when the program is actually rolled out or scaled, where governments usually fail is they don't roll it out in a way where we can measure its efficacy. And they don't roll it out in a way where we can use continuous measurement to make sure that were the original promises on equity, were they actually true? Because we know the original promises because of the voltage drop aren't going to be true, but does voltage drop happen differently for different groups? Don't know. But when we don't roll out programs at the government level in a way in which we can actually estimate did our program work, it's lunacy. And I see this all the time. People get an idea is what is Elaine said earlier, you have a narrative, um, the mayor will roll it out, but then they roll it out in a way that makes it nearly impossible to measure its efficacy. And I'm not even fully talking about rolling it out in an experiment. You don't have to. I mean, that's obviously the gold standard, but there are many ways you can roll out a program using quasi-experimental approaches that will at least give researchers a chance to figure out, did it work at scale? We don't do that enough. We, we don't take seriously that each time we make policy change, that's a unique moment in time in which we can measure if it works and who does it work for. Fundamental mistake that we constantly make as humans and as institutions. They have it right in Silicon Valley. When we roll something out at Lyft or I was at Uber before, you do it experimentally. Amazon's doing it. We need governments to do it as well. Yeah. Because people who we serve in, in our governments are just as important, if not more important, is who's jumping in a cab or, or ordering from Amazon. Oh. And the fact that we don't require that and demand that from our policymakers is beyond me. But I think we're moving in the right direction. So I don't want to end on a, on a sour note. And, and maybe that'll change a little over time, John. Um, and I'm not disputing anything that you said. I mean, but part of the challenge on the government side and the political side is generally when you announce something, you have to declare it a success already. That's a different problem now. Right. I'm, <laughs> not different... Waiting, I'm not waiting for it with every respect. I'm not waiting for some social scientist. I, I, I hear to, I hear you. To, to I tell hear me you. six but... months from now, six months later that your 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 idea worked. I, no, this is this is no, no, absolutely gonna work. It's gonna revolutionize your life. Right. I, I hear the kind of two Hang camps on. are one, I have to say it works. The other one is remember, even long-term policies might have surrogates. 
Yeah. It's called doing a surrogacy analysis. Mm -hmm. And I understand that policymakers might not like a surrogacy analysis, but if they want the truth, mm -hmm. even a long-term policy, you can, oh, sure. you can estimate surrogates. And if it's yeah. done appropriately at ground level, yeah. you can begin to get some evidence. But I totally get your point. Yeah. But the one, uh, one last thing I'd add, though. But the other thing that we definitely don't do in government enough is evaluate our ideas our policies after a legitimate period of time. We, we don't go back five years later. How did this work? Is it still working? What else could we be doing? Because again, as Elaine certainly knows, the one of the hardest thing to do in government is to kill a program. <laughs> the constituency has been developed money has been spent it was declared a success many many years ago and nobody really wants to go back there i mean you really have to mess up badly to get a program killed <laughs> it really it's either disaster or a financial scandal otherwise it will just continue on its own yeah it, can i comment on that uh, dana i'm sorry i don't want to take your time but um that's an even bigger reason why we have to get it right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because when we roll out a policy that doesn't make sense, it's you're right, it's nearly impossible to undo it. Right. And, and that's exactly why we need to understand signatures of ideas and policies that work and what is actionable evidence and take that part seriously. Dana, we, we got to get Dana in. You know, in yeah, you got to jump in. In the green room, she did threaten me with a scalpel. So I, mean, <laughs> I, <just, laughs> I want to speak up for Dana. I'm not sure what she was going to do, but I want to speak up for Dana. <laughs> it's, e it's easy to pontificate. Look, the, the bottom line is that I got into this work because I truly believe that science can be the core to social change. And equity needs to be a fundamental framework to go forward. So often as Mayor Nutter note, you know, notes, these advances actually only widen you know, um, gaps. And you know, for us to really make good on it, um, equity needs to be at, at the forefront. In addition, I think the beauty and the importance of science that populations need to buy into is that so often, and I, I saw this firsthand in developing programs, people so want to make positive change in the world. So every stakeholder wants the best, but so often things are sort of pushed forward based on gut and sort of ideology and these frameworks, and maybe we need to just clone Omar and results for, for America embedded into the bureau, bureaucratic aspect of government will ensure that because there are so many, um, you know, so many different issues uh, related to all stakeholders and we need someone holding this, our country accountable uh, and our policies and our researchers accountable. So I don't have much to add other than, you know, this is a critically important aspect to the work. Equity is at the core. We're good with the one Omar uh, here in Philly. Oh yeah, I think so. Uh, not, not, not sure we could take a second one. <laughs> <laughs> He's more scalable. I, guess. <laughs> I don't know. I doubt it. Um, listen, we have now five minutes left. I want to give the opportunity um, for each of you to provide a one minute kind of close uh, on uh, what, you, what you heard today, some, some, some high level reflections. Um, I'll start with, with, with Elaine. Um, if, if you could just kind of provide your overview, brief thoughts and, and or advice uh, for, for those who are listening. We had over 800 people sign up. We have uh, close to that number who are, who are participating. So any thoughts you have, uh, final thoughts would be, would be wonderful. You know, all I'll add is on, on the final discussion here, um, there is the Evidence-Based Policy Making Act of 2018, and the federal government is supposed to be, when it designs new programs, it is supposed to be including a comprehensive evaluation of the program in the in the legislation. So that's a huge step forward. Now, of course, 
as those of us in Washington know, there is a difference between authorizing something and appropriating it, which means that sometimes th these things are in the legislation, but nobody ever gives them any money to do it. So it, they don't always work. But I think that was a, a big step forward. And it gets around the political problem that we've talked about so much here, because what it what it allows is a program to go on. Sometimes you need you need a lot longer than a president's term in office or a mayor's term in office to figure out if something's going to work. Because after all, the the bureaucrats who are implementing it they're do, they're doing fine tuning as they go along, right? They're fixing this and they're fixing that and they're saying, oh, that doesn't work and this doesn't work. So sometimes it just takes a while to see if something's worthwhile or not. Therefore, having it embedded in the legislation from the beginning is, I think, a very important step towards getting evidence-based um, policy um, in our uh, political and governmental life. Elaine, thank you so much for, for, for a, a wonderful almost hour and a half. It's a great conversation so far. Uh, I'll go over to John. Hey, thanks, Omar. And, and uh, once again, I want to thank Brookings for putting this together and, and the other panelists. Thanks so much for uh, for participating. Now, for my, my one minute, I, I, I want to go back to when I worked in D.C., I learned a very harsh lesson early on. I learned that you have to evaluate the effects of public policy as opposed to intentions. Now we spend billions on governmental social programs every year from welfare to jobs, to education, to new mothers, to various health programs, all great policies on the face of it. Now, improving the quality of our lives should of course be the ultimate target of these public policies but the public policies can only deliver fruits if they're based on reliable tools to measure their improvement. What we're advocating here today is the only way to achieve that goal is to understand the science of using science. Now, our research advocates flipping the traditional knowledge creation model from evidence-based policy to policy-based evidence. What does this call for? This calls for scholars to place themselves in the shoes of policymakers whom they're trying to influence, understand the constraints at scale. And when you put forward successful interventions, you should look at what it looks like fully implemented in the field, applied to the policy relevant subject population, sustained over a long period of time in working as it is expected because its mechanisms are understood. In the end, experimental techniques and empiricism have been just a great boon for policymaking in the past several decades, but we're really never gonna achieve the great promise of science until we understand the science of using science. Oh, that was a great summation. Mayor Nutter? Sure, um, I encourage everyone um, make a plan work the plan, stick to the plan, pay attention, listen to other voices out there. Don't be afraid to make change or change how you're doing things, but do not get distracted by the negativity and nonsense of some and the loud voices of a few. Stick to the plan. Great advice. Dana, we'll wrap it up with you. Thank you so much. I'll keep my uh, my my uh, comments short. You know, the the science of using science and understanding scaling is without a doubt uh, one of the most critical issues that we face. It's the key to a fiscally responsible uh, government and to truly giving our population uh, a better quality of life. Um, it is a, a team approach and, it, and it's not one that's going to be answered quickly, um, but we need to move forward. I, I do wanna just say how much fun this was. Uh, what a great group. Thank you, Elaine and Mayor Nutter and Omar and you too, John. Um, this is an issue that at, at the TMW Center we're closely studying and we would love to and hope to engage more and more individuals and organizations in conversations like this. Um, 
I thank you all. Stay tuned for information on other events that we're going to be hosting with Brookings. And we hope to plan, plan to dive in even deeper into the challenges and opportunities of scaling in early childhood and far beyond. So thank you so much for involving us. Thank you. And thanks to everyone uh, listening who, uh, who spent 90 minutes with us learning about the science of, uh, the science of scaling. Uh, thank you very much, Elaine, John, Dana, and Mayor Nutter for, uh, for your involvement and commitment and engagement here. I think uh, everyone listening learned, uh, learned a, a whole lot about the work you do and what, it, what an incredible panel of expertise. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, I'll, I'll sign off. Thank you. Uh, my name is Omar Woodard, uh, VP Results for America. Thanks for being here with us today. Take care, everyone. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.